Hi, this is Kate, and this is the first video of week 5 of Math 23. We're finished discussing linear algebra for now, and we're moving on into real analysis, or the study of real valued functions. Before we get into the real meat of this material, we need to take a moment and talk about the real numbers. Let's begin. First, consider the natural numbers. The natural numbers are the positive integers, strictly greater than zero, starting at 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. They have the following, um, as Paul writes here, pretty obvious properties. What's not obvious is that these five properties are sufficient to prove any other property that the natural numbers have. The first one is that 1 belongs to the natural numbers. The second property is that if you have an element that belongs to the natural numbers, you can add 1 to that element and that will also belong in the natural numbers. The third property is that 1 is not the successor of any element of the natural numbers. The fourth property is that if you have two elements of the natural numbers and they have the same successor, then those two elements are in fact equal to each other. They are the same. And the last property is that a subset S of the natural numbers, which contains 1, and which contains n plus 1 whenever it contains n, must equal the entire set of all natural numbers. Let's take a look here. Axiom 5, this comment about if you have a subset that contains 1, and it also contains a successor for each element in the set, actually is equal to the entire set of naturals, that's related to a proof by induction, where if you want to prove an infinite set of propositions, or a proposition that states, for all cases, the following is true, what we generally do there is we prove the base case first, which is known as P1 in the notation in Ross, and then we prove the inductive step that says if we assume that it's true in the nth case, that fact will allow us to conclude that it's true in the n plus 1th case. These two pieces, the fact that we've shown that it's true in the first case, and then more generally shown that if it's true in the nth case, it's true in the n plus 1th case, means that that inductive step can be applied to the first case to prove the second case, it can be applied to the second case to prove the third case, and so on and so forth, and therefore it's proven in all cases. Now, there's another way to prove something for all cases, which normally sets you up to do a proof by induction, but what it really involves, instead of doing the base case and then the inductive step, is sort of doing uh, its complement or its opposite, and this involves using the least number principle. And what the least number principle says is that any non-empty subset of the natural numbers has a least element. And we're going to exploit that instead of doing an inductive step uh, in the proof strategy. So the way this works is you actually start off pretty much exactly the same. You say, okay, this particular property that I'm trying to prove for all cases where each case is a member of the natural numbers, uh, first, I'm going to prove that it's true for the base case. So our first step is this, proving it's true for p sub 1. That's the base case. Then instead of doing the inductive step, what we do instead is we say, assume that it's actually not true in all cases. Assume your luck runs out. There's only a finite number of cases where this statement holds. And then for the rest of the natural numbers, it's actually not true. Well, by the least number principle, that subset for which this statement is not true, those cases for which it's not true, their index numbers must have a least element. And so we say, okay, there is this k that's greater than 1, obviously, because it's true in the base case, right? But there's a k that's greater than 1, such that the kth case is, k is the least element of the case numbers for which this statement is false. So we say this statement is false for p sub k onwards. So what we've set up is to say this statement is true up to the k minus 1th case and then it's false for the kth case and beyond. Remember this is essentially a proof by contradiction so we're assuming that it's not, our statement's not true 
in all cases. And so instead, we're assuming that it's only true for a finite number of cases, and then beyond that, it's false. Well, then, instead of doing the inductive step like we would in a proof by induction, we actually prove the contrapositive of that, which is saying that if it's false in the k kth case, it will be false in the k minus 1th case, too. Which brings us to a contradiction, because we had said that k was the least natural number, the least element of the cases for which this was false. Not to mention the fact that if it's false in the k minus 1th case, then it's going to be false in the k minus 2th case, and false in that case, then false in the k minus 3rd case, and then all the way back to our first base case, which we had proven it was true for, but that first contradiction is really all we need, and that has now completely blown up what we had assumed, which we had assumed that it was not true for all cases. And instead of being not true for all cases, it was true for some, a finite number of cases and then false for the rest of the cases. And we've shown through a proof by contradiction and using the least number principle that that can't possibly be true. If there's a case where it becomes false, and this is the first case where it becomes false, because obviously it's not the base case. The base case we've already proven is true in the first part of this proof. But say we have the kth case, it's the first case where it's false. Well, we we show that if it's false in the kth case, it's going to be false in the k minus 1th case. So it's a little bit backwards work from the proof by induction inductive step. So we have a contradiction. The kth case was supposed to be the first case where it was false. The k minus 1th case is now a lesser natural number where it is also false. So we have this contradiction and we know that it's, this statement is not just true for a finite number of cases, it's true for all cases. If you're skeptical, think of it this way. If you say, okay, it's true for a finite number of cases, I've, so I've shown that it's true for uh, k equals 1, the base case, Assume that it's true for a finite number of cases and then false otherwise. You know, you could even extend that. Maybe you're a little wary that that's enough to prove a contradiction. Say it's false in the kth case implies that it's false in the k minus 1th case. Realize that that creates the same kind of domino effect as an inductive proof does. If it's false in the k minus 1th case, it's false in the k minus 2th case. And all the way back down to the base case but we've shown that the base case is true. So that's another way that you can view the contradiction. But just that first step is enough. You will certainly be using the least number principle uh, as an alternative to composing proofs by induction in sample problems and in section problems. As we fill out our study of the real numbers in a little bit more detail, we know that there are the rational numbers, which can be regarded as fractions in lowest terms. Note that uh, m over n and 2m over 2n represent the same rational number. And the rational number um, r equals m over n satisfies the first degree polynomial equation nx minus m equals 0. And more generally, a number that satisfies a polynomial equation of any finite degree, like this or this, is called an algebraic number. And in fact, there's a lot of work uh, in the textbook in Ross proving uh, the rational zeros theorem. And the rational numbers form a countably infinite set, which means that there is a bijection between them and the natural numbers, which means that I can remember what bijection means, means one to one. So that means that I can assign a, a natural number to each rational number almost like a serial number. And that means that even though there's an infinite number of them, as long as I have an algorithm for assigning just one serial number to every rational number, that they're countably infinite. And we'll do a proof of this fact for rational numbers in class. So many proofs rely on the fact that the rational numbers, or a subset of them, can be enumerated using serial numbers.